Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's Ask Me Anything session. My name is Christina Wood, Director of Programs uh, for Start and Scale Up Companies here at Communitech. And um, I'm thrilled to have um, Jagruti and Skylar back with us today um, to talk about term sheets. Um, so if any of you joined our session back in November where they talked a little bit about raising uh, early stage capital, uh, this is a continuation to that, that session. A few housekeeping rules that I'd like to go over before turning it over to Jagruti and Skylar. Um, today's session is being recorded. You should have received a notification up on your screen. Um, we keep all of our recordings on communitech.ca if you search for Ask Me Anything, um, and you can go there and use those sessions, previous sessions, as a resource. Um, so please feel free to refer to any of our any of the sessions we've done so far. I ask that you please keep your microphone on mute um, throughout the session um, and use the chat feature to ask your questions. So um, Jagruti and Skylar do have um, a presentation to go through um, today. Um, if you can hold some of your questions until the end of the presentation, they feel like many of them will probably get answered um, early on. Um, but if there is anything you were hoping to walk away with from today that wasn't covered in their slides, they're happy to, to take the last 20 minutes of today to answer all of those questions for you. Um, we also ask that you keep your questions on topic to term sheets specifically. We'll have some follow on sessions um, to dive more, uh, dive deeper into other areas of capital. Um, and if you do have specific questions to your company versus a more broad general question, happy to connect with you after today's session. So please reach out to your Communitech CSM or advisor and they will get you connected with your Grudy and we'll, we'll get those specific questions answered for you. We do have a couple of upcoming Ask Me Anything sessions. So we run them every Tuesday at two. Um, next week, we have one on content creation and branding, uh, followed by Shred um, and all of the pieces around, around that. So um, please check your startup or scale up newsletter or your Week in Tech for a list of all of our upcoming sessions. And uh, with that, I think I will uh, stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you, um, Jagruti and Skylar, um, to introduce yourselves. And once again, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Thank you so much, Christina. I'm, we are very happy to be back. And thank you, Skylar, for also joining uh, me on this, uh, the second of the series uh, of the uh, AMS. So a little bit about me, I am a community growth coach since October um, and uh, the three areas that I help uh, startups in is pitching, fundraising, customer success and anything tech related. Uh, and I also am an angel investor for last seven years and have invested in 50 plus companies. I have co-invested with Skylar and he is a really good friend of mine. I'm always learning and uh, uh, you know, as the industry changes, as things are changing, and also always a, a really, really happy to talk to founders, um, as we know that, uh, you know, there's so, so much information out there. So what, how do you, how do you, uh, you know, take what's out there on the internet or, you know, other uh, circles and apply it to what's important to you. So today, I, we are going to be covering different types of term sheets, uh, convertible note saves and preferred equity. So I invest in the early stage pre-seed seed stage as an angel investor. And Skylar actually also invests in early stage, but a lot larger check size and then much later stage. So we are hoping to cover, um, you know, a spectrum of questions uh, from a pre-seed seed to probably series A, series B when you are, um, you know, raising much higher rounds. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Skylar uh, to introduce himself. And uh, Sky, you said you would like to um, uh, put the presentation on. So I think yeah, you, you should have be, the you sharing right. See the screen right now. Yeah, we yeah. can see it. So. Perfect. Perfect. All right. awesome. Hey everyone. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you, Jags. Um, yeah. So Jags and I have um, have been co-investing together for the last almost three years now, um, which has been wonderful. And uh, as Jags mentioned, we, I, I do everything from uh, pre-revenue uh, companies, kind of pre-seed rounds, all the way up through growth stage rounds. Um, one of the larger uh, pre-revenue uh, deals we just did was at the end of last year, as an example, uh, was a nine million dollar uh, pre-seed round. 
Um, it was pre-revenue, pre-product, and basically pre-team. Uh, the team came together in November, um, led by uh, Founders Fund. And it was about three times oversubscribed, uh, which is pretty good for, for being pre-revenue, pre-product, and basically pre-team. So um, there's certainly do, do all stages and, and also a generalist for all verticals. Um, I'm going to do a quick little introduction, um, and then we're going to dive into the core presentation uh, just to give a little background. Uh, but we have some really great core slides going over the uh, the investment terms for convertible notes, saves, and preferred equity. Um, so a little bit about myself. I've been doing venture capital for um, about 12 years, um, and collectively between uh, my partner Andrew and James, about 45 years of, of venture experience. Um, over that time, we've invested in over 250 companies, uh, deployed about 1.8 billion, and have returned more than four times that cash on cash uh, back to investors. So not just increases in valuation, but actual cash back to our investors. Um, uh, we've invested in over 10 unicorns. So uh, we were early investors in Facebook, Twitter, Uber, Venmo, um, companies like Oculus. My, uh, one of my biggest exits I happened to have more recently was a company called Beyond Meat. Uh, I was the largest investor uh, prior to the IPO by dollar value. Um, that returned about almost three times my entire fund in three years. Um, and uh, so now I think right now is about a 14 or so uh, billion dollar valuation. Um, and then our most recent big exit um, is Wish. Wish just went, uh, just IPO'd, um, where previously we had a 10% uh, stake in the company. Now that's worth over a billion dollars, just that 10% stake. Um, and even in 2020, we had great exits like Made in Space, uh, which was only about an eight month hold period. Um, it had a, a good return on that uh, within eight months of only investing. So um, uh, certainly a lot, lot of investment experience overall. Um, VU is a fund um, in our, our Venture University program. Uh, we have three headquarter offices, um, San Francisco, New York, and Hong Kong. Um, but we also have investment teams throughout the United States, um, Asia, um, and in Europe. A um, little background just on Venture University. I'm going to keep it pretty brief. Uh, but we launched Venture University about three years ago. Um, it's now become the world's leading investor accelerator for people that want to break into uh, venture capital, private equity, and angel investing. Um, the investor accelerator program, you can either join for three months or 12 months, um, and you focus on deal sourcing, doing due diligence, and making investments. And you know that by the end of the program, you're going to have made two to five investments that you have upside in. And so you're really part of our investment team, um, but you know that you're going to have two to five investments um, in your track record uh, by the end of the program. Um, we also have a pure online uh, academic program. So if anyone wants to go in even deeper than what we kind of have during this session, uh, we have a VCP masterclass, uh, which is about 25 hours of content, 250 plus slides. Uh, we do that both live um, uh, as well as just doing a, a on-demand version of it. Uh, we have an advanced VCP modules for those that want to go much, much deeper. Uh, we have about 40 hours of advanced uh, materials uh, with exercises. Um, and for any of the online on-demand programs, we offer have uh, we also have a, a live Q&A session every Wednesday night just to ask questions while you're going through the material. So I'll stop there. If anyone has any questions about that, the program afterwards, just want to give a little uh, background on that before we uh, jumped in. So to, uh, to kick things off, um, you know, one of the biggest confusions, I think, is really understanding the difference between uh, convertible note and safe terms. Uh, they're, they're very similar, uh, but they have some really, really key differences. So I put together this comparison side by side, which I wish someone originally put together a side by side comparison just to really make it simple. So hopefully this will help um, solve any mysteries that you might have had. Um, convertible notes were certainly created much earlier than before the concept of a safe. The, um, the safe originally uh, well, they originated uh, with Y Combinator is the way that, that YC would invest into the startups as part of their accelerator. And then, then startups also started using it for raising their first rounds at Demo Day. Um, the creator on the legal side that created the safe uh, was Wilson Sonsini, uh, often ranked as the number one VC law firm. It's also our, our law firm. And so we can thank or uh, complain to Wilson Sonsini okay. about the creation of a safe. As you guys will see that safes aren't really all that safe for investors, but they're fantastic for founders. Um, so let's kind of get, dive in a little bit more on, on the differences between the two. So um, convertible notes um, are often kind of considered convertible debt will usually have a thing called um, a valuation cap or a discount or both. Um, they will usually not have none. We're going to get into more of the details of exactly what a, a valuation cap and a discount is. Um, high level, as before we go into more of the math behind it, the valuation cap will be the maximum valuation 
uh, that you would be converting into in the next uh, priced financing round. And the discount rate will be uh, a discount to whatever the share price is of the next round. So they're both of them are benefits to the investor, either you know capping the valuation that you're gonna convert into or providing a discount to the next share price. Um, so convertible notes will either have one or both of these um, features. Um, they usually will not have none. Um, so you will have either the, the valuation cap or the discount rate. Now on the safe, this is where kind of all, all um, you know, all rules are off on this. You could literally have one or both or none. And this is where safes aren't very safe. You could invest in a safe that has no convertible, uh, no, no valuation cap and no interest rate, sorry, no, no discount rate. Um, and so uh, that can put you in a position where you're just converting into whatever the next priced valuation is at yeah. that time. So you get no benefit of any, like you might invest a year, two, three years in advance and you get no benefit for it. Yeah, we'll go through an example of how one of my earlier investment that Sky knows about, um, I was in that situation and what were some of the things in the actual language of the safe that kind of saved me from uh, getting the right valuation. Um, so yeah, I dragged and Jags, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but I, I did a draft of that exact. Uh, oh, you did. So, so we're going to be able to go over that. But yeah, it's uh, yeah. Jags lived it, lived through the challenges of coming in on a safe that did not have a valuation cap. Um, and, uh, and really just, it was kind of at the whim of a, of a discount at a much higher valuation. So we'll go over a case study in a few minutes. Um, on and also that. just one observation because of uh, working with community tech companies and also working in Silicon Valley, I have seen a lot more uncapped saves at, uh, uh, with startups uh, at community tech. And actually the founders are not really aware of the situation where it could actually hurt investors. So that this is something that, uh, you know, and not to say you can't do it, you should definitely do it if you can get away with it from founders perspective, but from investor perspective, you know, it's not uh, really friendly. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to mention that. Correct. And then um, on the valuation cap side, kind of the maximum valuation that you would convert into the next round, uh, kind of a key feature that's different between a convertible note and a safe is convertible notes. Uh, the valuation cap is usually a pre-money valuation cap um, versus a safe historically actually has been a pre-money valuation cap, but the new safe that came out is now a post-money valuation cap. And the benefit of uh, the post-money valuation cap from uh, an investor and a founder's perspective is you know exactly how much ownership you're now giving away with every safe that you're doing. Uh, where before it gets kind of complicated, you start doing different safes at different valuation caps, um, and they're all pre-money, really knowing what you actually have as a valuation gets a lot more complicated. Uh, but by making the YC safe a post money, just a little bit more clear of what your ownership is going to be. So big, big feature, but convertible notes, usually it's a pre-money valuation cap. And now going forward, most of the YC safes that I've done um, have been on a post money valuation cap. The um, the, uh, you know, the, the, what is the valuation cap? Can, how, how should you set the valuation cap? Usually you can kind of think of it as if you're pricing the round, which is kind of one of the jokes about why founders do convertible notes to begin with, is they like to say, oh, I'm doing a convertible note because I'm delaying the conversation or the valuation of my company. When, if you have a valuation cap, you're basically pricing your company. So uh, there's no BS there. Um, and so usually you'll just say, hey, whatever the amount is for the convertible note, if it does convert at that valuation cap, the investors will get 15 to 20% roughly. So it's basically just another priced round, but in the form of a convertible note. The benefit of doing the convertible note over a priced round is really on pricing. So a convertible note will usually cost you around $5,000 to do, at least that's like the going rate for most law firms. Uh, if you were to do a safe, it's about $2,500. That's how much Wilson Sonsini will typically charge you for a safe. It's even fewer terms to uh, figure out and so easier to negotiate. Um, versus a price round can cost you anywhere from ten to thirty thousand dollars for like a Series A, Series B. So usually, if you're going to be raising a relatively small amount of capital, you don't want to spend a lot on your legal fees. So paying twenty five hundred for a safe or paying five thousand for a convertible note, you know, if you're raising fifty thousand, hundred thousand, it makes sense to do those. Anything when you kind of start approaching 
like a million dollars, usually that's when I'd say it probably makes sense to just do a price round and to have more of the protections that we're going to go over uh, from an investor's perspective to have it there. But anything under a million dollars in which, you know, sometimes with these pre-seed, smaller pre-seed rounds, it's why they do it. It's really more from a pricing and simplicity perspective, but it's certainly not at the benefit of the investor. And we'll go over why. Um, on, the, on the discount rate, usually the average discount rate is between 10 and 30%, but really kind of hones in really on 20% is kind of market standard uh, discounts. Um, and with a, um, a safe, the same thing. It's basically 10 to 30% for the discount, um, around 20%. Um, interest rate, also another reason of why safes aren't as adv advantageous. A safe does not have an interest rate where a convertible note does. Um, according to Wilson Sonsini, I kind of learned an interesting factoid. In order for something to legally be considered debt, it has to have interest. And so convertible debt gets to benefit from its senior position as a quasi debt because it has the interest component to it. Um, and so usually that's between five and 10%, basically a, a higher return than maybe you'd get with a savings account or a, a kind of a treasury uh, with prime in there. Um, but, uh, but it's just designed to be something a little higher, but you know, no, no investor is investing in a startup with that type of risk for the interest. Nobody's investing for the interest, but it's like, a, it's extra. It's nice. You're going to get some additional shares uh, for the value of the interest. Uh, but the safe kind of just did away with the interest or like nobody's investing for the interest anyways, let's just remove it. Uh, the downside is you're actually in a more junior position with a safe than you are with a convertible note legally. Um, so a convert, if you had a convertible note and a safe outstanding, the convert, even if the safe happened afterwards, the convertible note is actually senior to a safe um, based on how it's standardly written, which is again, not so safe. Um, then you have maturity date. Uh, maturity date is when uh, the convertible note um, is going to be due. And technically the investors can then call the money and say, okay, you owe me the balloon payment now of all the principal and the interest. But the reality is most investors never um, call the capital at maturity because you'd be putting the company into bankruptcy probably because they're not gonna have the money to pay you back. Um, and so usually you end up just extending the maturity date another six or 12 months. And you're, you'd rather the company try to actually raise a financing round um, and have it convert into equity than to you know put the company out of business. So usually you just extend the maturity date when you hit it. Sky, one comment here. I had one entrepreneur who's, um, who had an investor and he was, uh, he had a, he, he misunderstood that, oh, I am going to, uh, no matter what, going to get liquidation at this, you know, when the note matures. So it, that, that's also something that if you're working with the first time investors, you really want to make sure that they understand just because a note matures doesn't mean that you uh, are liquidated or anything. It may, may, means that your shares are now, um, uh, you know, priced at a different valuation and in a different round, and you are able to take advantage of the discount and the interest rate, um, uh, and you have a cap. And hopefully, the company is worth a lot more than when you invested. So you want to make sure that the investors are not saying, "I want my money." You said, "Liquid," you know, we're going to get out of here in you know eighteen months or whatever the time frame is, the maturity date is, and I want to liquidate. So that's something that you also want to make sure the expectations are set correct from the uh, founder to uh, first-time investors. Or yeah, correct. And usually the maturity date, the way you set it, is based on when you think the next financing price round is going to happen. Um, so you think it's going to happen in six months or twelve months. Um, but the goal is that the convertible note or safe will convert, well, the convertible note will, will, will um, convert prior to the maturity date. So it's more of a, an estimated timing of the next financing round. But it is true, technically, you could push the company into bankruptcy um, if you called the capital at maturity and it has not converted yet into equity. Now, the whole thing about maturity dates, which is why investors kind of laugh at the maturity date, is you literally are probably just going to extend the maturity date if you hit the maturity date. Um, and you'll just keep on kicking the ball, you know, down the, the road. Um, and so because of that situation of not putting a company at risk of pushing into bankruptcy, um, the safe said, well, let's just do away with the maturity date. And so there is no maturity date on safes. It just converts at some point in the future, whenever another round happens. Um, so it could be like, you know, four years in the future, um, it converts. Um, 
then you have the, what's called a qualified financing or QF. A qualified financing for a convertible note is a specific amount of dollars, uh, which may or may not include the value of the convertible debt. So let's say you're, you say the qualified financing is a $2 million qualified financing. That's the size of the next financing round. And the question is, well, does that 2 million include the value of the convertible notes? Let's say you raised $500,000. Does the 500,000, are you only raising 1.5 million of new cash or are you raising 2 million of new cash? And that makes a difference of your cash runway. Um, so usually, uh, I prefer as an investor that it's just all fresh cash and that it's not, not inclusive of convertible notes, but it can be written where it does include the convertible notes. Um, and whatever the qualified financing amount is of fresh cash, you ideally want that to last the company 12 months of runway. Um, so that's how you would, you know, how do you figure out what the qualified financing amount would be? Basically say, well, what's the 12 month runway um, amount in cash? And that's how you, you set what the QF should be or what you think the next round is going to be at least to get them 12 months of runway. Um, now, again, what's fun on the safe is there is no amount set for a qualified financing. They could literally raise a dollar for their next round, and that would trigger your safe to convert into equity. So there is no set amount for a qualified financing. Um, that's risky because, again, they could close on less than 12 months of runway, and now you move from a more senior position into a junior position of just equity. Um, and it could be even converting into common equity, which would really suck. But some, some safes don't even convert into preferred equity, but into common. And so, so it sucks for investor, but from the founder perspective, do you fantastic. think it's fantastic? Yeah. yeah. Because then you are moving the previous investors into a junior position. Yep. And yeah. And you have no threshold of, you know, you don't have to raise a particular amount of money. So it's just easier hurdle for you because yeah. it's anything. Yeah. Um, which again, I, I, it's not, you're not going to have the most sophisticated investors usually doing safes unless it's coming out of YC's demo day. Um, but, uh, it's why investors don't like safes. Um, then you have the concept of the difference between optional versus mandatory, uh, conversion. So optional conversion is if the next priced round is less than the qualified financing amount. So let's say it's a 2 million qualified financing and the company ends up raising 1.9 million, just shy of 2 million, you can say, okay, I'll still convert. Like, even though you didn't hit the, the amount, I'll still agree optionally at my, at my option as an investor, I'll agree to still convert because it's 1.9 million. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, but if you, if the company does raise the qualified financing amount, then you are, it's a mandatory automatic conversion into equity if you hit that. So kind of at your option, if it's less than the qualified financing or automatic mandatory uh, conversion, if you hit the qualified financing amount. What's uh, again, from the safe perspective, it's just automatic conversion. Any size amount you convert and you don't have a say in it, just any amount that is the next round raised, you'll convert. Um, and then lastly here, the liquidation preference. Um, you know, normal convertible notes um, will usually be, I shouldn't even say stay away from normal, but many convertible notes will just be in the event that the company is acquired while the note is outstanding and has not converted into equity because there was never a price round that happened. If the note, if the company is acquired while the note's outstanding, you'll uh, at least usually get your one times your, your principal back plus interest, assuming that the company gets acquired for at least that much money. Now, most investors invest in, in convertible notes, not just trying to get their money back plus interest. So usually what I do, and it's become more, mar why I stay away from normal, more market standard is to kind of make a liquidation preference of like 1.5X. I probably I do that with almost all my convertible notes, where if the company is acquired while the note is outstanding before a price round happens, um, I'll get 1.5 times my money back plus interest um, or... The, if, if the value is even greater, if it converts at the valuation cap, if there is one, or at the last priced round, last uh, share price, whatever the last share price was. Um, so it's the greater of one, one to 1 1.5x, usually it could be up to 2x, um, but usually 1.5x or the, the value of the common equity if it converted at the valuation cap or the last share price. So uh, again, it gives um, investors that are taking a significant amount of risk in early stage companies and the ability to get back more than just one times their money and some interest. Um, same thing is true of safes. So I've, I've usually edited safes basically to mimic this logic. 
um, if the company is acquired while the safe's outstanding to get back the the one to two x um, or the value of uh, converting at the valuation cap or share price, if, assuming that there may actually be a valuation cap. Again, the safes could have a valuation cap. They could have a discount, but they might have none. Um, and uh, I guess, sh should we take any questions there, Christina, or just keep going through the slides until the end? I think we can keep going through Go the slide right. really quick and the last 20 minutes or 25 minutes, let's Perfect. do the- All right, cool. Yep, yeah. can definitely do that. So um, so this is kind of, this slide is really to give an example of the valuation cap versus the discount math. So in the example here, let's say we have a $500,000 convertible note with a valuation cap of 10 million, which is gonna be the maximum pre-money valuation. And we have a discount of 20%, 7% interest, maturity 12 months. What is the difference between whether it's converting at the valuation cap or the discount is really what this, this quick little math shows you. So if the next priced equity round is a $2 million round, now again, that 2 million may or may not include the value of the prior um, notes. Let's just say it's, it's all, all fresh capital. Um, if the next pre-money valuation is eight million uh, with a share price of a dollar, so that would assume that they have eight million shares. So eight million pre-money divided by eight million shares is a dollar per share. Um, because the eight million val pre-money valuation um, is less than the ten million dollar valuation cap of the note, um, then the note plus the interest will convert at a twenty percent discount of a dollar per share. So the convertible note plus the interest would convert at 80 cents per share. So basically taking the 20% discount, doing 0.8 times a dollar, gets you 80 cents per share. And what's nice about this is that you put in 500,000 and you're basically gonna get 600,000 worth in equity. You get the 500,000 plus the interest, but you get the 20% equity value. So 20% of 500,000 is another 100,000. So you're getting 600 plus thousand with the interest in equity value um, by converting at a discount um, into that next round. Now, on the flip side, let's say the next round's pre-money valuation is 15 million um, and the share price is now $1.87 and you still have the same number of shares, let's say 8 million shares. So again, 15 million as the pre-money divided by 8 million shares gets you this higher share price of $1.875. Um, um, because the pre-money valuation is now greater than the valuation cap, um, the note plus the interest um, will convert at the $10 million valuation cap. And so well, what is that share price? You would say it's the 10 million valuation cap, which is the pre-money. So 10 million divided by 8 million shares gets you $1.25. So while all the new investors coming in on that price round are coming in um, you know, at, uh, um, at the $1.875, you're coming in at $1.25. So you got the benefit of the valuation cap there. So um, there is no discount at that point. Uh, I thought they, they would still get the twenty percent discount. No, it's, it's it's or so it's just the the the, the, the oh it's uh, or okay yeah so okay. you'd only get the discount if it is at less than the valuation cap. Valuation. Um, okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, otherwise, if, it was, if, 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 yeah, if you got if you had if you still had both, then it, you would never really have the valuation cap, right? Because you just it would always be less. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's only in the event that uh, you're getting the 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 better of uh, those. But if it if it ends up being above ten, then you get the ten. Um, for the key point here, as just a key takeaway that uh, Vac, Jags also already brought up, is that in the event that the the note or the safe does not have a valuation cap, it can be extremely harsh for investors um, because it might convert in one, two, three, four years in the future at a really high valuation. And if you're just converting at that next valuation or even a discount at a really high valuation in the future, you didn't really get a lot of the benefit of taking such early stage risk or you know being so early in time. So again, not so great for investors to do safes and, um, and notes without a valuation cap. Maybe I can just uh, tell the story right here because- Yeah, here it is. Relevant. You got it. This is, <laughs> this is the, the case study that I created for Jags, but she actually lived through this and I, I helped her through this journey with the founder. So I'll go really quick and then we can go more into the slides. So there was a company that I invested in 2017, April. In 2017, March, this company was uh, uh, evaluated uh, at, you know, had an investor come in at $5 million cap in 2017, March. And in 2017, April, uh, there was myself and two other investors at the time, I didn't know who they were, invested in a safe note 
which was with no cap. So I did, I was not as smart as I am right now um, in 2017. So I signed that. And last year, actually December 31st of nine, 2019, I was on the phone with Skylar for a few hours and what happened was the company now raised series B, they raised 12 and a half or series A, 12 and a half million dollar at $50 million valuation. So before I invested, there was one or two investors that came in at 5 million. And then myself and two other investors, again, who I didn't know them at that time, um, signed the uncapped note. And after that, 19 investors came at $8.75 million cap. And when I got this 29 in, in 2019, uh, uh, um, you know, pr priced round uh, DocuSign, I'm like, why am I being converted at the current value pre-money, which is 37.5, because she raised 12.5 million dollar, um, you know, at 50 money, 50 50 million post money valuation. And the people who came after me for three years are at 8.75. So I reached out to the founder and founder said, well, it's too bad, this is what you signed. So then um, I contacted the other two investors who also invested uh, with me, um, you know, in the same terms, I found them on LinkedIn and I contacted them and they said, yes, we are not happy either. So then three of us with Sky's help drafted a letter um, and but fortunately, one of them was an attorney, one of the investors was an attorney and said, uh, the reason that she had to convert us at 8.75 million, which was before all this 19 million investors came in the safe note, she, you know, th there was a clause that said that if you take any new investors, you have to let your previous investors know what the share price is that you are raising at. She failed to tell us that. And 19 people came after us. So we found a loophole that we kind of presented to her saying, okay, either, either you convert us at 8.75 or we go and you know, file a lawsuit. Uh, and it was a pretty you know, significant money. It wasn't just 2,000, 1,000, but even if it was, I would have still followed up. So the lesson learned for me is not to sign uncapped safe and always make sure that you know who are the other investors with you in the round. So we, Sky can. Yeah, so the case, I, I took what, what happened to Jags and I kind of put it into not the exact same numbers, but essentially the same point is certainly felt. So um, this company- you Don't this do that as a founder. Yeah, don't, yeah. So anyway, this is, uh, these aren't the, the same same exact numbers as Jags, but they're directionally you get the same story across. So, let's say a company um, raises a convertible note in 2015 at a 10 million dollar valuation cap and a 20 percent discount, and then they do a, a safe in 2016 with no valuation cap but a 20 percent discount, and then two years the next two years they do two more convertible notes with valuation caps. So a $15 million valuation cap and a $20 million valuation cap, both at 20% discounts. And then in 2019, they finally raise a preferred equity round of 10 million at a 40 million pre and a $50 million post. So in this scenario, um, the safe investor would convert at a $32 million valuation, which is using the 20% discount. So 80% of the 40 million pre um, gets them the 32 million. Now, What's sad is that the, the safe investor invested in 2016 took significantly more time risk than the investors in 2017 and 2018. Um, and so while they invest, they, they converted at a 15 and $20 million valuation lower than what the safe converted at 32 million. So it's kind of like, what the hell? I took way more time risk and I'm investing at twice the valuation as the person that invested a year after me. Like that doesn't seem right. Um, and so again, you kind of create bad blood for your investors um, if you end up doing this. Um, but again, sometimes founders will, you know, get convinced, oh, let's just do a quick safe with no valuation cap, but then let's go back to doing convertible notes with other investors afterwards. And, um, and it's just really unfortunate. And had uh, the terms not had that one provision that Jags had, um, you know, the founder basically was telling Jags, you know, pound sand, like, you know, foolish you for not being as sophisticated as an investor, but pound sand that you, you signed the terms that you signed, no going back. Um, and so you, you feel, you feel the pain when that happens. 
and and we you know investors even though we, we you know it's a, it's a large community but at the end of the day it's pretty small if an investor get, gets un, you know treated very unfairly in a situation like this uh, we are going to make sure that we tell everybody about that entrepreneur and same thing with entrepreneurs right i mean if an investor really uh, is unfair to you as a founder you're going to say stay away from that investor so the moral of the story is do the right thing make sure that everyone understands what they're signing um, and encourage them to get their legal counsel and you know do the right thing as you would uh, have ha happened to you i guess correct um, to go a little bit more into the interest rate, just a, a common question that usually gets brought up is, is the interest rate cumulative or not cumulative? The answer is it's whatever is negotiated. Um, uh, usually it's cumulative. Um, so it keeps on building on uh, whatever you had before, but it can also be designed as not cumulative. Um, and the interest rate is usually between five and 10%. Um, again, nobody's investing. There's not like, a, there's never any negotiations around the interest rate, just kind of is what it is and you just kind of move on. Um, the interest rate does not get paid um, uh, in cash, so it just builds up in value, um, and then it will eventually convert into equity at whatever the next uh, share price is with the discount or the valuation cap. So you're, you're really just getting extra shares. Um, and again, the, uh, the safe does not have uh, interest rates. Um, the maturity uh, date, we kind of went over this already. Um, uh, the key thing is that the, you're just going to kind of kick the, the time out if you do hit the maturity date, usually. Um, and it's really there just to give you a timeline of when the next financing round will happen. Um, we talked about this already, so I think we kind of skip this one, but qualified financing again is the minimum amount of capital that the next one has to be to qualify for the notes to convert into equity um, and safes don't have a specific amount uh, set for this. Um, the con conversion of the note into equity, key thing is that um, with convertible notes, um, you could technically convert your note prior to uh, maturity, even if a financing round does not happen, um, if it is written as such. So if you, for whatever reason, were like, I really wanna convert now at a certain valuation, you could. Um, you'll just lose the, the senior position um, that you have. So at maturity date, for example, you could choose at maturity to, you know, it, could, it could be written. And I've done this with convertible notes is I'll write it where if the company does not raise a qualified financing, by this time, then it'll just automatically convert at this determined valuation. It could be a much lower valuation kind of to, to give you the value of no qualified financing happening. Uh, but if you want to avoid any kind of bankruptcy uh, type of issues, you could just say, hey, um, you know, if I don't raise the convertible, if I don't raise the financing round by this date, I'm just going to auto convert my investors at this much lower valuation. So you can do that. So Sky, I wanted to, um from the founder's perspective, um, is it wise to convert before the maturity date? No, you uh, well, from a founder's perspective? Yes. Oh yeah, you'd love for your investors to do that because then in that situation, it could be converting into common um, or preferred, but right. uh, yeah, you definitely as a founder, but it, it'll be at the option of the investor, not the option of the founder to converting prior to maturity or again, even prior to a, a, um, a qualified financing round, so. So if the maturity date comes, right, and I'm a founder, if the maturity date comes and mm -hmm. my cap is $8 million, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a scenario where I am not where I thought I would be at a point, at this point, but I have to either convert or extend. Um, and let's say the investors are against extending. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you do as a founder? Uh, what would be yeah, the right you can, you can definitely offer your investors just to convert their... Uh, convertible note at a much lower valuation, right? You can say, hey, you know, we we didn't write, raise a qualified financing, we've hit maturity, you can either extend the date or let's agree to convert at this lower valuation, maybe half of what the valuation cap was uh, that you had, but you, you basically can negotiate it. So it could convert and then you just write it out. Um, again, that that's the, the maturity date basically creates a point in time in the future where you're going to have a conversation with your investors. It's like, it's, this is the point where we're just going to sit down. We're going to talk about how to make things go, you know, go forward. Um, if, for example, actually, uh, I'm on the advisory committee for um, a university's fund for the University of Buffalo and, and all the SUNY schools. It's a, a $15 million fund. And uh, they had a standard term sheet that they created for investing in the founders coming out of that school or the SUNY schools of like 60 of them. And I, I recently modified their term sheet that they were going to use 
which says a lot of times they're going to probably invest in lifestyle businesses because they're like, they're not unicorn potential, but they're like companies that could create some jobs. And so I said, well, you should add a new, another provision here, which says if you hit maturity and you haven't raised a qualified financing, but you're profitable, we will have it where you're going to give us back 1.5 times our money. And that could be in the form of like a payment plan, but only in the situation that you're profitable. Um, my goal is not to put you out of business, but like if you, if you create a nice lifestyle business for yourself and you're throwing off like a million a year in, in cash flow, uh, and there's no way in hell anyone's going to invest in this company going forward and nobody's probably going to buy the company, you know, at least, you know, give us back 1.5x um, then or over time with a, with a payment plan um, for helping to give you that early cash to help you grow that lifestyle business. So uh, I updated the terms for them and uh, recently got that approved. So that was uh, kind of, you know, being mindful about they're not necessarily always investing in unicorns, but they're just trying to invest in the startup community for their, um, you know, within their ecosystem. All right, now we're going to jump into uh, preferred equity rights. Um, the uh, thing I love about preferred equity rights is there's a lot of freedom that you can have uh, in just coming up with any right you want. Now, you want to be careful not to get overly creative, and you should probably stick to just the, co the, co the common preferred equity rights that we're going to go over. But theoretically, um, I could, you know, as an investor, I could create a preferred equity right that says, on my birthday, the company will send me a birthday cake. Like you could create that. It's I've never done it before, but I'm, I'm in my means of potentially asking for that. Uh, but it really is, you can get creative if you want to, just be careful not to get too creative because it could backfire on you. But the most common special rights that uh, preferred equity has um, is firstly is the liquidation preference, uh, which is that you'll get back one times your money or a higher multiple that you might add in. So you might add a 1.5, 2X or 3X, but usually you keep it at 1X. Um, you don't want to set negative precedents where all future investors will want the same uh, liquidation preference multiple. So if you start off with a 2X for your seed round, your A round, B round, C rounds might start asking for 2Xs as well. So reserve that usually only for your later stage rounds. Uh, like when Uber was raising, you know, a billion dollars of capital, they had a 2X liquidation preference because the investors aren't going to risk putting a billion in without at least getting a 2x back for themselves before anyone else gets anything. But this so is the can return. You, can you as a founder start off because let's say that I'm a founder who is uh, who needs capital right now mm -hmm. um, and I'm the investor comes and says okay I need 2x liquidation otherwise I'm not going to you know sign the convertible note or whatever. And then I'm doing really good in the later stage. I said, okay, 2X is a little bit too much, right? In series A, can I go back down to one and a half? And how do I, what would I tell my investor if they say that, hey, earlier rounds you did 2X. Now, why are you giving me 1.5X? Is there a graceful way to not piss off your investor, but also do the right thing for you? Yeah, so if you ended up um, accepting, uh not ideal terms for like your seed round. Let's say you accepted a 2X liquidation preference for your seed round. Um, and now you're doing well and you're raising a series A. Um, you can talk to your series A investor about having the conversation with your seed investor to say, hey, um, I'm not going to lead the series A round unless we remove this 2X from the previous seed investors. And you basically tell the seed investors, are you going to stop your portfolio company from so raising more capital with a great lead, or are you going to reduce that 2x to a 1x or 1.5x? And so whoever has the money uh, for the follow-on rounds can kind of dictate and change terms of a previous round, assuming that you get the approval of the previous investors. So the seed investors would have to approve reducing their liquidation preference. But again, if you kind of put them against the wall and say, I'm either leading this deal or I'm not leading this deal, and unless you seed investors are willing to carry this company with you know a few million going forward, then the company is out of luck and doesn't have any more money right now. Maybe they only have like two or three months of cash runway. So you choose, would you, you want the company to go bankrupt or you want the company to raise this next series A? Um, and so you would have to have that conversation between the series A investors and the seed investors to, to fix kind of any um, unfortunate terms that you might've accepted early on that were higher than, than market standard. And how often does that happen? Not often. I've only done it in my, like in my 120 or so investments that I've made. I think I've only done it twice. 
Yeah. So it's uh, it's pretty rare. Um, usually founders don't agree to more than a one X for their, yeah. their student series A rounds. Um, but you know what I'm finding, Sky, and I'm on Clubhouse right now. There are so many actually conversations happening on Clubhouse that are actually really taking uh, advantage of the founders. Sure. So I'm really like, you know, it may not happen, but just be aware of it. Yeah, correct. You know, be careful. Um, then you have warrant coverage. Doesn't come up that often. Usually comes up when you're trying to avoid um, creating a, a down round. So you'll you'll raise your next round at a flat valuation, but you'll issue a bunch of warrant coverage. So effectively the share price is less, but technically it's still a flat round. So it doesn't trigger anti-dilution. Uh, but warrant coverage is basically offering investors the ability to buy future shares at the current share price for a certain period of time. Could be like 10 years. Um, so it's basically just an option to buy cheaper shares in the future when the valuation goes up. Um, and essentially, they're kind of like cashless execution because in the event of a liquidity event, you know, a week before the liquidity event happens, you basically take how much you, you, you would have gotten from that liquidity event. You just take the difference um, in the value of how much you would have to pay for them versus what they're worth. And it's essentially a cashless um, execution of the, of the warrant. Uh, but if you did want to um, execute the warrant prior to a liquidity event, um, then you'd have to just pay the, the share price um, that you got as a, a discount to maybe what it is um, in the future. Um, then you have the concept of anti-dilution. So uh, there's two main types of, of anti-dilution. There's weighted average and full ratchet. Full ratchet, you almost never see, but it conceptually exists. Um, it sounds really great for investors and it is terrible for founders. And it's so uh, punitive in dilution, which is why you almost never see full ratchet. But the concept is if your private, if your you know, venture fund investors have full ratchet and you raise a down round, let's say you, uh, the last valuation was 20 million and the new valuation is 10 or 15 million, you will just create additional shares to give to your prior investors to maintain their ownership. And the founders and previous investors get diluted significantly um, in that situation. So it's basically no dilution to the prior investor that has the full ratchet anti-dilution. It's just super dilutive to founders. You don't see it. What more often happens is um, weighted average, which it takes the, uh, the new lower share price that's happening for the down round and the share price that you came in at. And it takes the, the average of those two share prices and you get additional shares based on that average share price. And so it doesn't completely uh, make you whole from not having any dilution, but it definitely softens the dilution um, so it's not as significant to you, uh, which is a nice benefit. So it's, it's not as painful for the founders, prior investors to, uh, to be able to give you that, that, those additional shares, but it's not gonna make you whole, but won't be as dilutive. Um, so now, if you have a convertible note in safe, you don't have to worry about anti-dilution until you convert it into the preferred. Yeah, note. so if you have convertible notes or safes, they'll convert into the next round and you'll get all these rights uh, of the next round. So whatever these preferred equity rights are, you would then have those once the safe and convertible note converts, yes. And this is assuming that the next round is lower than the convertible cap. Uh, this is assuming that the like there's a price round that happens and then the next price round that happens, the second price round that happens, okay. you would then, uh, if that second round is at a pre-money valuation or sh really a share price less than the previous share price, then you would trigger anti-dilution, which is, again, if you do warrant coverage, you can do technically a flat round at the same share price, but you issue like 50% warrant coverage. So your investors are effectively getting a lower share price because of the warrant coverage, but it's technically a flat round and, there, and there's no triggering of anti-dilution. It's kind of a, a cheeky way of raising more capital without increasing the valuation, really than actually doing it at a lower valuation effectively, but technically it doesn't uh, exist as it doesn't, um, it's not considered a, a down round when you do the warrant coverage, uh, but everyone knows what the hell you're doing. You're not you know, tricking anybody. Um, you're really just, you know, it's an unfortunate situation for your prior investors that aren't getting the benefit of the anti-dilution. Right. Then you have the protected provisions, which is my favorite of all the sections. So the protected provisions are really there to protect the investor against things like um, you want to go raise $10 million of bank debt. Um, the preferred equity gets to say yes or no to you raising a whole bunch of bank debt. Or if you want to increase your salary from 100,000 to a million dollars, 
because you just raised a $3 million round, be like, nope, can't do that. Or if the founder one day wakes up and is like, you know what? I want to issue like a billion extra shares to myself. Can't do that. So you can't go and issue just a bunch of shares just because you want to. Um, you also can't change, the founder can't change any of the preferred equity rights just because they want to. So they can't take away the liquidation preference. They can't take away pro rata rights, anti-dilution rights, things like that. And you could also have things like in the event that you sell the company for less than two times or three times that I invested, if I'm not going to make a two or three X on my money, but you're selling the company, I want to have a say in that. Um, at least as a vote, as like a majority of preferred wants to have a vote if you're going to sell the company for less than two or three times that we invested. But if you sell the company and we make more than two or three times, you don't need my approval. Like tomorrow, if you can sell the company for two to three times, go for it. Um, so you have kind of those protective provisions um, really to avoid the founder trying to, um, you know, do things that might be really good for them, but not so good for the, uh, the so, preferred equity investors. Well, I so from the founder's perspective, the protective provisions, which are the ones that they get screwed on from investors. Well, it's basically just to protect the investors. So um, it's really the, to, it's not, the protective provisions are not designed okay. to have any operational control over the company. Um, it's really just things that tie directly to making you more junior or less great um, as terms of what you've already had. So again, you can't go issue a bunch more shares because that would just dilute me. You can't take away my, my 1X liquidation preference. And these um, are common things. Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's yeah. A, there's the standard set of the protective provisions, uh, which makes sense to have. Um, some of the nuances that can be in there is like, you can't increase your salary as a founder by more than ten or twenty percent per year. If you do it within that range, you can do it. If you want to increase it by more than twenty percent, you need the approval. That's kind of on a case by case type of basis that you might add in. And this is a voting situation. So the Series A as a percentage of the Series A usually might say two thirds of the series A investors have to vote in favor of you raising more than a $5 million of debt. So you, you will be not voting as common equity, but you'll be voting as a class right. of preferred equity on, on those protective provisions. <clears throat> um, so, Guy, I was thinking um, that, at, you know, we are very close to, we have seven minutes left. Yep. Uh, should we take question? Yeah, we, we can certainly take questions. If, uh, these next uh, two slides would go fast, but I can be happy to, to start taking questions if we want. Uh, Christina, do we have any questions or we should? No, nothing's come in. So why don't audience, if you have any questions that haven't been covered off thus far, start putting them into the chat while Sky goes over the next two slides and then we'll make sure to hit those questions before we wrap up. Does that sound cool. good? Yep. Perfect. Um, so other types of preferred equity rights are like dividends, um, which might be paid in cash or paid in kind to get additional equity. Um, a mandatory redemption doesn't really exist anymore, but it exists as a concept, which is if you, you know, let's say I invest as a preferred equity investor, if five years go by and you don't sell the company, I can tell you I want to get liquid and I want you to figure out a way to sell the company or find a way to create a liquidity event for me. Um, and so that, that exists as a concept. It's not, it's not market standard to have a mandatory redemption, but you can have that in there. Really common uh, preferred equity right is a pro rata right, which is your ability to invest uh, additional capital in the future to maintain your ownership. Um, so if I own 5% in the company and I have a pro rata right, in your next financing round, I can keep on putting more money in to maintain my 5% ownership. So that's pretty standard. You have information rights and inspection rights. So that's, uh, you know, being able to get quarterly financials, annual financials, quarterly bullets, annual bullets about operational things. Inspection rights is like the ability to go and visit the company or request an audit um, of the financials. Um, whoever the lead investor is, the lead investor will usually get the ability to get the board seat uh, that gets created in that preferred equity round, or they can appoint a board member. There's also the concept of uh, most favored nations, which is whatever terms I'm getting are the best terms that anyone else is getting in this round. So whatever the terms are, these are the best of the best terms. If there is anything better, I'm going to get the, you know, we're all getting the same best terms, but a most favored nations clause. And then on the employee option pool, that usually gets um, created during I wouldn't really, it's not a preferred right, but it's something that happens during the preferred equity round is you'll create an employee pool. Usually a series, a seed round will create a 20% employee pool. 
Series A will be 15%, Series B 10%, but it's, it's basically how much equity you have available for giving out to other key hires. And it also could be shared with the founders, but it's usually designed for, uh, for bringing on other people in the team. And this is not dilutive to the preferred equity investor in that round. So if you create a 20% employee pool and I'm gonna invest and own 20% of the company as an investor, there's a 40% dilution that just happened for the founders or previous investors. Um, so it is uh, punitive, but it, to the degree that you could always not use that employee pool and you could get it back and everyone's ownership goes back up if you don't use it. But it's basically setting up the company for success. And then if you, yeah. let's say you use 10% of it over the next 18 months and you raise your you know, series A, you might only increase it by 5% and go from 10% to 15%. Um, so in total dilution, you would have the dilution from the series A plus that extra 5% dilution of going from a 10% pool to a 15% pool. So a lot of times um, I get questions from founders that, um, you know, if I am raising a seed round and I have family and friends, right, or uh, some early angel investors, and I'm allocating 20% employee option pool, I want to do it post raise, not pre raise. And the investors who are coming in this round, they say, no, do it pre raise, not post raise, because I don't want to get diluted going walking in my first step. Mm -hmm. So what is the, what is it, what is, what do, what is it, um, you know, what do most people do and how do you um, work with uh, investors that are coming in to kind of, um, you know, uh, have this dilution happen, um, uh, you know, for, good for everybody, not yeah. just for well, one. Typically the, the, the employee equity pool will get created when you do your first institutional raise, meaning you have other professional investors, venture funds coming in. Mm -hmm. Convertible note saves don't create an employee option pool, which is also the downside of doing convertible notes and saves is you could actually, as a convertible note or safe investor, you could get double the dilution as a convertible note or safe investor um, and don't not benefit from that. So the, the benefit of doing a preferred equity round is you get, um, you're not gonna get diluted as an investor by that, but it does get set up and you're really delaying dilution for yourself as an investor, but yeah, normally it's it's pretty market standard just for it to get established in that first institutional um, capital raise where you have professional investors um, in there. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, last thing I'll just touch on for this one is um, the big, big difference between convertible preferred versus participating preferred. So convertible preferred is you're gonna get the greater of either your liquidation preference or the common equity value versus participating preferred as you get both. So it's double dipping. So you get the liquidation preference of one or two X plus you get the common equity value. So you're double dipping. And so mm -hmm. most times um, uh, VCs just do convertible preferred equity, but if there's a slightly higher risk um, in the deal, you might find uh, participating preferred, but but most VCs do convertible preferred as their, their stand. So I'll, I'll stop there. I know we had one more slide on um, non-dilutive capital, but just for, from a time, I'll, I'll stop there for questions. Perfect, thanks, um, Skylar. So we do have a couple of questions that have come in um, from Aaron. So in what scenario would you as an investor want to convert into equity at a maturity date? Um, and so the question goes on to say, if you are worried that they are not running the company well, could this make sense? Alternatively, if the company is not doing well or is doing well, pardon me, and making money um, and won't need to raise again, is this desirable? Yeah, correct. So yeah, if the company is not doing well, um, you're really better off just kicking out the maturity, maturity date, date, hoping mm -hmm. that they'll eventually raise capital. Um, you know, just getting equity in a failed company doesn't really help you very much. So usually you just extend the, um, the runway, uh, ex extend the runway for the maturity date. So you maintain your seniority as convertible debt, um, but you just extend it. So in case the company does get acquired, you'll have a much better chance of getting back your money. So if it's not doing so well, definitely don't convert it usually into to equity. Um, that usually would not be a good idea. If the company does not raise a qualified financing and is doing really well, then you might consider converting it. Um, and, uh, and that's just like, maybe they didn't need to raise any more money. They became profitable and they're actually doing really well. Um, then you might choose to convert um, at the valuation cap or the last share price, however it's been negotiated. Uh, but yeah, that would be the two, two scenarios there. 
Okay, perfect. The follow-on question from Aaron is, how often do convertible notes slash safes translate into common slash voting shares? When is this appropriate or not? Sure. So safes um, have the most high frequency where it might say it converts into common equity and just another way of um, not being great for investors. Convertible debt almost never converts into uh, common equity um, unless it's on where the company is being acquired while the note's outstanding. If the company is being acquired while the note's outstanding, then it might convert into common equity um, or if, if that's greater than the 1x or the 1.5x. Uh, but usually never. It's only safes that really are converting into common um, in the future that you'll see kind of, it just, it goes back to just not really ideal terms for investors. But in most cases, it'll just convert into the next round. And the most high probability is the next round will be a preferred equity round and not a common equity round. Um, yeah. And so most cases you are, whether it's a safe or a convertible note, you will be converting into preferred shares. Hey, uh, Christina, I just wanted to add something about the first question that, you know, uh, if the company is not doing good, um, there was a company that I invested in, the company was not doing good. Um, and we, we had a conversation on what should we do. And we kind of extended the maturity date and to our surprise, the company completely turned around. And um, so, you know, it's really important to understand the reason why uh, you would want to convert into equity? Is it because you think founder is not doing what it needs to do? Or is it the market? Is it the product? Is there a hope for the company to uh, turn it around? So there are a lot of factors in understanding why you would force the company to turn um, convert into equity at a maturity date. And, and to answer the last question that uh, Neuro just put in there, um, so to motivate investors into kind of a lead role for a series A, would you kind of recommend offering preferential terms for a certain period of time. You don't see that for um, incentivizing a Series A investor. You do see that for convertible note investors. So you might say, if you invest in the next 30 days into my convertible note, I'll give you a 25% discount. And if you invest in 60 days, I'll give you a 20% discount. And invest in 90 days, I'll give you a 15% you know, discount. So you might have a, a declining discount rate um, trying to get dollars in sooner for the convertible note. So you will see those things or maybe differences in valuation cap, but series A investors, you pretty much just, everyone gets the same terms. There is no difference in terms for the lead investor versus the co-investor. Um, everyone just coming in on the same terms. So you don't typically see that for, for price rounds. Okay, I think that uh, wraps up for the questions. Um, I want to take this opportunity once again um, to thank you, Skylar and Yuja Grudy, for joining us today. Uh, this has been awesome, I think, so informative for our companies. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, this session can be found on communitech.ca. Be up in about a week or so uh, for you to refer back to. Um, Skylar, not to put you on the spot, I don't know if you're able to share out, uh, you know, the slides or a version of them um, that we can send out. Uh, as a follow-up to today's conversation as well. Um, but yeah, just want to thank you both very, very much for your time today. This has been great. Um, and have a great week, everyone. And we hope to see you back for next week's AMA. Awesome. Take Thanks, care. everyone. Stay thank safe. You. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.